About two years ago, Catalyst Church started with the mission. The mission is simply to create a place and a church that when you looked at somebody or when somebody walked in, they, they wouldn't be judged, they wouldn't have been disrespected, they wouldn't be looked down on. And as the church started, the DNA started to, to, to work its way in. One Sunday, we had somebody walk in that entrance there. Invited by one of you guys on a friend day. She walked in. She sat in the back. She felt welcome from the very, very beginning. She looked a little bit different. She acted a little bit different. She was not churchy at all. But she walked in. And all of you who are here loved on her. That day, she came to know Jesus Christ. She came to know Jesus Christ. And her life has changed. Come to find out at the very end of the service, she came to me and told me that she was going to head home that afternoon from work. Already had a gun loaded and was going to kill herself. Because we were the church and didn't look at her in any different way, didn't act a different way, didn't say, oh, I'm going to put on a mask when I'm here at church. Her life was spared and eternity was going to be an eternity with God instead of the other place. Catalyst Church, I'm so very proud of you. Because I know for a fact, if a prostitute walks in with all the things a prostitute wears, or the lack of, maybe doped up from that evening, maybe just had a, a situation that happened in her, in her life an hour ago, she all booze up, walks in, I guarantee you 50 of you guys would go loving on her and would not show the F-bomb favoritism favoritism is from the pits of hell ladies and gentlemen it really is favoritism destroys families relationships favoritism destroys the church you got Baptist Pentecostal you got Lutheran you got Nazarite you've got non-denominational and it separates because you favor something and you crazy favoritism and I'm going to tell you the truth it ain't good so today, if this is your first time, you're going to enjoy the message. Because the message is kind of like a little slap and a little reminder to us who are church folk that favoritism is not good. And if we realize that as a church from here on out, because it gets so easy, and this is what I've realized within Catalyst Church and other churches, i figured out this, that as soon as we get comfortable with other people that we are around, we ended up becoming a social club, a group of people that are so inwardly focused that we don't care about the people who start walking in. And I'm going to tell you, that ain't going to happen here. Because it doesn't happen here. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Catalyst Church, where you are loved no matter if you're black, white, purple, orange, green. No matter if you've just had... Um, a cigarette out there, by the way, if you smoke cigarettes, make sure you smoke over in the corner, all right? So it's not a dust of smoke around, but we love you. If you're boozed up from the night before, welcome. If you're high, <laughs> how many of my am I? Are we two, one, two, or three, or four of my? Or can you see me clearly? But you're welcome too. <laughs> if you're fat, skinny, Blonde, brunette, redhead, tall, short, rich, poor, welcome. This is the church of God around you right now. Do me a favor and turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 35. And we're going to look um, at an F-bomb. 
And this whole series, and when, when I advertised it uh, last week, you're like, what on earth is he saying? F-bomb. And I'm not going to ask you to pronounce to me what you think the F-bomb is. That's not appropriate here. But what we are doing is we're going to be talking about four different F-bombs. And the first one today, what, what, what do you think the first one today is? Favoritism. We're going to be talking about favoritism. Next week, we're going to be talking about forbidden. The week after that, we're going to be talking about faith. And the week after that, we are going to be talking about forgiveness. Those four words, those four weeks, are F-bombs. People don't, people don't want to talk about them. People don't want to live them out. Because favoritism is an ucky word. And I'm going to tell you the truth. It's hard not to show favoritism to some people that I favor. And we're going to get to that in a second. So if you would, turn your Bibles. Um, where it would... Page 25, page 25 in your red Bibles. If you do not have a Bible of your own, the red Bibles is yours to keep. Keep that Bible, take it home, it's yours. If you have a Bible at home that you do not understand, take the red Bible as our gift to you. Take it home, it's yours, put your name in it, um, and it's yours to keep. So page 25, we're in Genesis chapter 37, and we're going to be going through, was that 36? 26. What? Just 27. All right. We need to pray for you, Randy. Did you get a good night's sleep? Genesis. All right. Listen to. Read this. Not listen to me. Read that. Genesis chapter 37. Here we go. We are going to be looking through the four weeks um, through the life of Joseph, an amazing character in the Bible, and it starts in verse one. Jacob lived in the land where his fathers had stayed, in the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob. Joseph was a young man the age of what? Seventeen. He was tending his flocks with his brothers, and his son, and the sons of Bila, um, and the sons of Zipha, his father's wives. And he, Joseph, brought their father bad reports about them. All right, pause right there. Anybody have a brother, sister, sibling, co-worker, that's a tattletale. Ethan Michael Whitmore. My son, okay. Madison Kyrene Whitmore. And they take after David Michael Whitmore. Joseph was a 17-year-old punk that liked to tell on his brothers. And he had a handful of brothers and he liked to tell on them. Anybody can relate? And you wonder why he, he wanted to tell on him. And we're about to find out here in a second. So he's a tattletale. Now Israel, that's Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his sons. Because he had been born to him at an old age. And he made a richly ornamented garment robe for him. I'm going to pause right there. By the way, I'm going to introduce you. This is wife, my wife, Rachel. Everybody say hi to Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Isn't she beautiful? You better say yes. <laughs> Rachel's going to take some notes up here. What we're doing is we are going, just in this story, going to map out some things that favoritism causes, okay? So if I miss something, make sure you raise your hand and I'll, by the way, this is, this is an open place, so just raise your hand and we, we'll just have a dialogue type of thing. All right? So here is Jacob, a.k.a. what's his, what's his other, his official name? Israel. So this, the um, Israel that you hear on the news and everything, that is the, the country where Jacob is and that was founded and owned by Jacob. So Israel, this is the father of, Jacob is the father of Israel. So we have this guy, a 17-year-old guy, his name is who? Joseph. So those are the, this is the key character of the whole story. Joseph was loved. He was shown favoritism to above all of his brothers. And I'm going to tell you a personal story. I, my, my mother died when I was born. Within three hours of my birth, uh, my mother passed away. I have never seen my mother I've ne my mother has never hold me, held me, whatever the vernacular is. I miss my mother. 
three years afterwards, my mother, my, my father married my current mother. She's been my mom. She's been my mom. A couple years after that came my brother. And then came my sister. And I know they're probably going to watch it afterwards, so this is kind of therapeutic. Mom and dad, listen. There's a difference between favor and favoritism. Favor means this. I like something. And we're going to get to this more in detail later on. I, personally, I favor wearing no shoes. Cha-ching. Okay. I favor wearing no shoes. Favoritism comes into being this. All of you who don't wear or who do wear shoes, I don't like you. Because you're not like me. So I'm going to look down, treat you different, talk bad about you because you do not wear what? Shoes. So I favor no shoes. You favor shoes. All right? Should, and socks, please, yes. Listen. My mother and father started showing favor to my brother and sister. And that, that, I understand that. I understand that's their biological children and there's just something about that. I understand that. But over the years, and this is, again, th very therapeutic. Over the years, I started to be ridiculed more than my brothers and sisters. I started to be demeaned more. I started to get in trouble more. I started to feel that I was not even welcome in my own family. Because they, my parents, even my own father, showed favor, what? Tism. To my brother and sister. My brother and sister, my sister has been divorced. My brother has had many issues. And here I am trying to do my dead level best to preach and be a godly man. I'm trying. Do you think that has changed the favoritism even though I'm a pastor and they're screw-ups? It hasn't. Because favoritism hurts. And it's hurt me over the years. And I'm telling you the truth. This passage here, I can relate very very well to the brothers because my brother Daniel is kind of the Joseph of this story right now. Alright, see so with me? Verse 4. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they what? Hated him. So I'm going to write hate, Rachel. Please. So the cause, one cause of favoritism is what? Hate. Is it true? Yes. You hate those who seem to hate you. So it goes like this. He loved them more and they hated them. And they could not speak a kind word of him. About him. So go ahead and put, say gossip or just um, language. Just put, what's that? Slander. slander. There you go. I like that word. Slander. So they hated him. He slandered him. Alright, and we'll keep going. Joseph had a dream. And when he had told his brothers, they hated him even more. So put times two. He said to them, this just Joseph said to them, Listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain and out of the field, and then suddenly my sheaf rose up and stood upright while your sheaves bowed down to it. How many of you guys, if you would have heard that dream, would have been, yeah, 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 we're going to be like bowing down and worshiping you, brother. How many of you guys would have hated him more? How many of you guys would have slandered him more? Oh, you guys are dishonest, so that's okay. <laughs> His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? We, uh, will you actually rule over us? And they, what? Hated them more. 
times again. They hated him more and more and more. All the more because the dreams he had said. Then he said to, then he had another dream and told his brothers, listen to me. I had another dream. And this time the sun and the moon, the eleven stars, were bowing down to me. When he told his father, as well as his brother, his father, what? Rebuked him. So go put rebuke. He was angry. His father, who loved him, started to get mad. Said, you know what? You're not, I'm not going to bow down to you, boy. I'm not going to do what you tell me to do. When his father told him this, he rebuked him. And then let's go to verse 11. His brothers became what of him? Jealous. Jealousy. But his father kept all of this in mind. Now let's flip to verse 23. Verse 23. So this is what ended up happening in, in the passage that we didn't read. Joseph was, was a shepherd boy and he was sent out by his father and, and the rest of, uh, rest of the brothers, they went out and, and they herded the sheep in some foreign country. Father told Joseph, hey boy, go check up on your brother. So Joseph did that. He went out and he checked up on his brothers. He went to a city. They weren't there. Come to find out that they had moved to a different, different um, um, sheep herding area. At that time... The brothers saw him from a distance. How many of you guys thought that they would be throwing a big party for Joseph? Oh, here comes my boy Joseph. Come on in, Joseph. Let's have some fun together. No, what do you think they did? They tried to kill him. All right, here we go. Verse 23. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe. And by the way, side note, the robe actually meant that Joseph was going to be the next leader of the clan, of the tribe, of the family. It was this beautifully long robe, kind of like a priestly robe, with ornamented colors, beautiful, beautiful, rich colors, extremely expensive that his father gave to him. But most importantly, it dictated who was going to be the what leader next after Jacob, a.k.a. Israel, died. So the very first thing they did to the robe is what? They stripped it off of him. Verse 24. And they took him and threw him into a cistern. Now the cistern was empty and there was no water in it. In other words, a watering trough. Very, very deep. Just threw him into the cistern. Verse 25. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Israelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices and bombs and myrrh and they were, they were on their way to, key word is where? Egypt. And we'll pick up in Egypt next week. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain... If we kill our brother and cover up his blood, come, let us what him? Sell him. So greed. Go ahead and put greed, Rachel, please. Greed. Greed is another thing. You're jealous and you're greedy and you want to go get move ahead of your brothers or those who you are jealous with. And then it says, come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and do not lay a hand on him after all he is our brother our own flesh and blood his brothers agreed so when the merchants came by with his brother pulled his brothers pulled Joseph up out of and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt when Reuben um, returned to the cistern he saw Joseph was not there he tore his clothes and went back um, to his brothers and said, the boy isn't here, where is he? Then they got up and took the robe and slaughtered a goat and dripped it with blood um, on the robe. They took the ornamented robe back to his father and said, we have found this. Examine to see if it's your son's robe. Not our brother's, your son's robe. He recognized it, that it was his son's robe. Some ferocious animals had devoured him. Joseph was surely been torn into pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned 
from for, for his son many days. So we got lying. Did you catch the lie there? You got lying. You got deceit. And then what happens to the father? He's sad. He grieves. All the sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, in mourning I will, um, in mourning I will go down to my grave to my son. And the father wept for him. Liar. How do you spell liar? Oh, that sounds good. Lying. There you go. Deceit and weep and sad, sadness. Sadness. Okay. All right. Interesting story. Great story? Yeah, not great for Joseph. When did Joseph issue start? Pride? Joseph had a little bit of pride, but when did Joseph's issue start? When the father what Joseph favored him. They might have got along before. He was a little tattletale. Yes, 17 year old, so he was probably a little tattletale. But when favoritism entered the situation, that's when issues started. That's when hate times really three or four. Slander started. Rebuke started. Jealousy started. Greed, lying, deceit, and sadness. And the list can go on. And I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, listen. If you show favoritism in any way, shape, or form, you will cause this to others and even yourself. I don't know some of you guys. But I know America. And this is what I know about America. America is very much a favoring and knocking down other people, aren't we? If you don't look like us, act like us, smell like us, or look like us, we are going to disregard you. And that is not from the Bible. That is not from God at all. So this is what we're going to do. Just in the last couple minutes that we have, we're going to look at this and ask our questions about favoritism. So put on, don't, don't look at somebody else now. Look at yourself. Do you favor something or somebody or do you show favoritism to this? Uh, here's an, okay. Favor is the following. Again, I like something. Alright? Favoritism is the following. Here's the definition. The practice of giving unfair preferential treatment to one person or group at the expense of others. Let me ask you, do you think God shows favoritism? You sure? Does God show favoritism? Raise your hand if you say yes. Raise your hand if you say no. Raise your hand if God shows favor. Raise your hand if God shows favoritism. Good. There you go. Good, good. Favor. He favors people who do what is right. He favor if you read your Bible, God say, Add a boy, add a girl. That's good. Read your Bible. That's awesome. If you're praying and talking to him, he's like, I, I favor that. I like that. But do you think God's gonna get ticked and angry at you if you don't read your Bible? No, he's not. He's gonna be like, Do you love me? Then you'll read your Bible. But I'm not gonna look down on you and say you're a piece of junk if you don't read your Bible. And I want you to get that about God because this is what we think and Rachel grew up in this, this mindset. If you screw up whatsoever, God, the loving God, is going to strike you with leprosy. He's going to strike you with whatever disease. He's going to strike you with lightning if you do just one little thing. And that's not my God. My God is loving and He's caring and He loves you and me so very much. This is my God. Love is God. The Bible talks in a passage and it says this. It says this. Whosoever, in 1 John 4 verse 8, whosoever does not love does not know God because God is what? Love. So if God is love, notice the two differences between the two. You can say God is, but in this passage in 1 Corinthians it says God is or love is this. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not self-seeking. Love is not proud. So do you think Joseph had a little bit of pride? 
Absolutely. Love is not easily angered. Love is kind. Love always protects. Love, is, love does not envy. Love does not delight in evil. Love does not boast. Love rejoices with the truth. Love does not dishonor others. Love always trusts. Love never keep, keeps no records or wrong. Love always hopes. Love always perseveres. That's God. I think we view God as this. We sadden God. We make God angry, so he hates us. God rebukes us. True, because he loves us. God slanders us. We, we have this kind of screwed up thought about God because we th sometimes think that God shows favor more on a pastor than somebody else or one or the other. And I'm telling you, that's a lie from the pits of hell. So if you are a Christ follower, do you live this way or do you live this way? Lord, I do pray right now, Lord, that as I finish this message in the next couple minutes, that you will use this last point in some mighty ways. Because, Lord, right now I'm trying to get out of my mouth and into, into the hearts of people here the importance that, God, you love us so much. Lord, I know that there's at least one person in here that says, how can a loving God love me? How can you, God, love someone who is in this room that is having an affair? How can you, God, love someone who's a drunk? How can you love someone who's constantly look, looking at pornography? How can you, God, love a religious zealot that's all about religion and not about a relationship? Lord Jesus, may they know right now as we finish this last little bit that yes, you show favor and you bless those who do what is right, but you're not going to look down on others and show favoritism to them. Lord, let me get this last point out with clarity. And may Holy Spirit, you do your thing. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans 2, verse 11 says this. God does not show favoritism. You are loved by God. John 3.16, the most favorite passage, says this. God so loved white people that he gave... God so loved straight people that he gave his only son to die for straight people. God lo so loved fat people God so loved the world. So why do we as Christians love the other way around? Here's the awesome news. God so loved you. Your screw-ups my screw-ups, your sin, your past, your present, and He'll love you in the future. That's why He sent His only Son to die 
for us. Screwed up sinful people. Black, white, rich, poor. All. Those who were raised like me in a very Christian life, yeah, he died for me. For those of you in this room who have been locked up, imprisoned, he loves you. I think we don't get that. Romans 10, 12-13 says, For there is no difference between Jew or Gentile. The same Lord is the Lord of all the richly blessings. All who call on Him, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be what? Saved. So what does that mean for us? I'm going to read a passage in James real quick and close. It's this. James chapter 2, 1 through 4. It says this. My brothers. And he's talking to Christians here. My brothers. As believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Do not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting, and it's talking about church here. Suppose a man or woman walks into this place here, walks into this church building, wearing gold ring and fine clothes. And then a poor man walks in with shabby clothes, also comes in. If you show special attention to this man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you. But say to the poor man, you will stand over there. Sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? And then verse 9, it says this. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law and our lawbreakers. So here's the deal. God knows your heart and he knows my heart, doesn't he? He really, he really does. He loves us unconditionally. So Catalyst Church, here's a reminder. If someone walks in this room and they're rich, what are we going to do? Love them. If someone walks in this door and they're poor, what are we going to do? If someone walks in this room and they're gay, what are you going to do? If someone walks in this door and they're straight, what are you going to do? If someone walks in this door and you know their past, and you ask the question, why on earth are they here? They need God. Yes. Are we going to love them? It's easy, it's easy to do this. And it's hard to go give a big hug to your enemy. If your wife, ex-wife, ex-husband walks into this room what are you going to do? that was even more powerful of love and death. what are we going to do? <laughs> ah there you go because love is patient love is kind Love always protects. Love never keeps a record of what? <coughs> Wrong. You know where I'm going. If someone who is African American, they walk in this room, what? Love them. I would love it to see this multicultural church here with black, white, Asians, Hispanics, 
and all that and throw those words out the door and says, I love you as a person. So Catalyst Church, it's time to stop showing favoritism. Because here's the deal. I've seen it already. In some of you, I've seen it. We have a lobby space right out there right now. Last week, I saw a couple couples sitting there that in society looks different, might be act different, maybe be kind of quiet, but there are two or three couples sitting there by themselves. I went over to them, and as soon as I walked up, they had a big smile on their face. Not because it's a pastor. Why did they have a smile on their face? Because someone came and talked to them. May we never have cliques. May we never have people that are pushed to the side because we love everyone. But God so loved the world that he gave his only son for you. Do you get that? That's just not a religious word. A religious verse. It's life changing. God loves you if you're gay. God loves you if you're straight. God loves you if you're black, white, purple, or green. God loves you and sent his only son to earth to die for you so that your and my sins can be forgiven. And God demonstrates his own love for us that while we were still sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. So do me a favor. Bow your head and close your eyes for just a second. Have you had the mindset that God could not love you? Then guess what? You don't know my God. My God loves you and has been patient with you. My God loves you so much that he's been trying to be kind to you and he has been kind to you. And you're like, my life is just so screwed up. Yeah, that's not his fault. God knows, does not keep record of wrong. That's why he sent Jesus to wipe the slate clean. So the question right now is this. Do you favor, like love, God more than yourself? Or are you showing favoritism to yourself against God? Jesus Christ came to this earth. God in flesh came to this earth. And he says, I love you. I'm dying for you. Even though you are or was or am, he loves you. But you have to believe it. You really do. So it's as simple as this. You admit that you are a sinner. Do you admit that you do things wrong? The Bible says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But then as already mentioned, but God demonstrates, He shows His love for you. His patient, kind, not self-seeking love for you that He sent His only Son to die for you. And He didn't die of cancer. He didn't die of any other form other than a brutal, painful death on a cross with nails driven through his hands and feet, with a crown of thorns shoved on his head. But before that, he was beaten to a pulp. He didn't say, stop, 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 that hurts. No, he says, bring it on, I love him. Every stripe, 
every nail, all the way to the last breath of Jesus. His last breath was simply, It is finished. He didn't say, It is finished for this stereotype or that stereotype. He said, Whosoever, He's calling you right now. Don't fight it. It's time to make it a real deal. So I'm going to lead you through a prayer. The prayer does not save you. It's your heartfelt desire to accept the call that Jesus Christ has given to you. And that call is to take this gift that Jesus gave to you. And to live it out day by day. So do me a favor. Bow your head and close your eyes like you are. And then just pray a prayer, something like this. If you, if you want Jesus, say something like this. Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. I have faith and believe that you came, you died, and you rose again for me. Forgive me of my sins. And help me live my life the best way for you. With absolutely nobody looking around. If you prayed that and you really meant it, you just really, really, really meant it. Going to raise your hand, right? Where are you at? Fantastic. Anybody else? Anybody else? Just raise your hand up and high. Nice. Fantastic. Go and put your hand down. For those of you who, who pray that prayer and raise your hand, just look at me for a second. Just look at me. Congratulations. You have stepped into the greatest decision that you have ever and will ever make. Congratulations. I mean that wholeheartedly. Do me a favor if you would. There's a little long card on your seat. Just fill that thing out. Drop it in one of the mailboxes on the way out. With the sole purpose of us trying to help you through this journey. Congratulations. So Catalyst Church, look at me for a minute please. Favoritism within these four walls or these all these walls. Yeah, that's kind of easy because everybody else is not showing favoritism. Let's not do it. But how about when you leave? How about your family? How about your children? We're going to sing a song here. We're all going to stand in a minute and sing. Whatever God has spoke to you about, whoever you are showing favoritism to, maybe it's an ethnic group, maybe it's a social status, maybe it's a race, maybe it's your own children or family, it's time to give it to God and say, I'm so sorry. There's prayer benches at the side or you can come down here or you can kneel at your seat. I want to encourage you with this. Do not leave this place without doing business with God. Because when you get out there, the world starts knocking at you. But you're in a safe place here. And maybe you've already showed favoritism to someone inside these four walls. Maybe during this time you need to go to them, give them a big hug and say, I'm sorry. And start it out right. So God, I know this message has been not meant necessarily a story. It's been kind of a reminder that you don't show favoritism to anybody. But you love and have called us to yourself. Jesus, thank you for what you've done, what you're going to do. 
Thank you for those who have taken that step of faith and said, Jesus, I'm yours. So God, I do pray that as we do business with you, may we not be distracted by the food or the noise or anything, but Holy Spirit, rock our world from the inside out. And as we stand, may you be the center of our lives. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Let's all stand.